Hey everyone, I'm now on Patreon. Click the link below. Not only keep the free content coming with tutorials, tips, podcasts, etc., but get a bunch of free stuff like live stream Q and A's, copy of my book, voting on topics, behind the scenes, bunch of cool stuff. Click the link down below to join. Hello everyone. Welcome to episode eight of the Scott Stokely podcast. And I said I was going to be doing as many of these as possible from interesting and cool locations. And I'm in Colorado for a f just a couple more days uh, before I say goodbye to my beautiful Rocky Mountains. Uh, we're gonna be heading to Tennessee to do some caving and then off to Florida to, to do some scuba diving. That's our winter plans. And I wanted to do my podcast from a location that Colorado, well, it's what we're most known for. I wore my raggedy old Colorado disc golf shirt I've been in the mountains. I'm kind of mountain manning it. But like I said, I wanted to do on location for what is Colorado. Unfortunately, Castle Bonita is still closed. I was waiting all fall because of COVID. They're still not open. I couldn't do a podcast from Casa Bonita. So instead, uh, we climbed to the top of a 14,000 foot peak and we decided to shoot it from up here. I guess I'm, it relates, right? People know that there's mountains in Colorado, right? It's not just Casa Bonita. Okay, so this is gonna be another podcast where I'm just gonna talk, but I think I got some real funny stories. I think this should be, I believe, entertaining. Uh, by the way, if you've never been at 14,000 feet, there's significantly less oxygen. So if you see me panting and trying to catch my breath, that kind of comes with it. Uh, also, the sun is very bright up here. And uh, if you see me squinting, I'm basically staring at the sun. So you won't see any of this on the audio version, but on the YouTube version, I'm gonna look pretty rough, but we're in Colorado. It's what you do when you're in the mountains. So I had a person call me uh, a, a friend of mine the other day and he asked me how I deal with the haters uh, apparently I'm a bit controversial and a bit polarizing um, no actually I was aware of that it's mostly on purpose so we'll get to that and why it's not a bad thing it's actually a good thing or it can be and he wanted to know how to deal with them because the, the thing that he did wrong, I mean, he brought all these, all the haters on himself. I mean, he really dug his own grave with this one. You see, he got good really quick and started winning pro tournaments after just a couple years playing. And I mean, how dare he? How dare he be successful and work hard and achieve something? But when that happens, out come the haters. And they were getting to him and he wanted to know how how I dealt with it so I started thinking about it and realized there are a, a range of haters and again not all of them are bad a lot of them are actually essential to sports and essential to building a brand depending on the brand you have and some of the haters are assholes and I've had to come to terms with how to, to deal with them so I thought I'd just kind of share a bunch of stories about my experience with the mixed <laughs> reviews I've gotten in the disc golf community. And um, yeah, I mean, let's go from there. So uh, when I was playing in the 90s, the haters weren't really so much of an issue because there wasn't social media. You didn't really have a voice back then. And that meant if you wanted to hate on someone, you basically either had to talk behind their back and you might not even know they're doing that, or you had to say it to their face. And most haters, they won't, they won't say it to your face. They like the anonymity and the safety of their keyboard, right? So I didn't really experience a lot of that. Uh, about the only people that you would say were haters or people that rooted against me, but that's okay because I was playing sports. Uh, that's what sports is, you know? I mean, I've never heard a bad word about Peyton Manning in my entire life. But when he went into Foxborough, he got booed out of the building. So when you play sports and you are a uh, 
professional athlete. That, like that's just something you have to accept. Uh, when you're an amateur, it doesn't matter that you're not a professional athlete. You're playing amateur division. You go to a tournament, there's people that are rooting for their friends. So people are gonna root against you. So there's nothing wrong with the hate that comes simply by people rooting for somebody else. There are players I've seen that, um, that get offended by that. Like they want everybody to like them. Somehow it's a reflection on them. And that's never been the case. I mean, I like when people are rooting for me, but I enjoy it just as much when they're rooting for somebody else because again, that's, that's what sports is. So I didn't really experience a lot of the hate back in the 90s. The biggest reason why though is that I didn't need to do anything that would bring on hate because I was, that was good. I was setting world records and I was winning tournaments and I was building a brand and a name for myself, but I could do it on the, on the playing field. I simply by setting world records and going farther than anybody, I built a following and I built fans and I built people that bought the discs, discs I recommended. I didn't have to do anything special for it. And in fact, I think being controversial would actually have been a detriment because people like me as a competitor like why rub anybody the wrong way it wasn't necessary so I was pretty vanilla I was probably a pretty boring person off the field then I leave the sport for 13 years and I've talked about this in other podcasts and other areas and then I I came back and found the sport and needed to make a living out on the road and the only thing I knew how to do to make a living when I came back was a business model I'd run before which was I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna do a free throwing clinic because I'm Scott Stokely I've had world records I mean I used to have them now I had them it's past tense but that's still a name and I had world and national titles and I'm just gonna go out there I'm gonna run a free clinic but when I do that a bunch of people are gonna come out and when they come out they're gonna play my event they're gonna buy my discs I'm gonna want my autograph and that's what's gonna happen I'm gonna make a bunch of money because the sports blown up and I started scheduling these events and um, no one knew who I was. <laughs> um, I, that's not true. There were people who knew, the old timers knew, the people that are into the sport heavily knew of my name, but for all intents and purposes, I didn't have a brand. My brand was gone, my ship had sailed, time had passed. And so I needed to, to get people out to these events. I mean, this is how I knew how to make a living on tour, was getting people to come out. And so I had to get my name back in the sport. I had to become a recognizable figure to build my business. Now, the option I would have preferred would have been to go out and compete for a world title and set world records. Oh, that's not gonna happen. I'd been gone for 13 years. I came back at 44 years old. I wasn't gonna compete at the highest level. There's nothing I was gonna do that was gonna bring me to that place. So, I was in a bit of a quandary. How do I get, how do I get people to pay attention to me so I can build my business, build my brand? And I came up with an idea. So, I'm a big MMA fan. And if you follow MMA, there's a, a fighter named Chael Sonnen. And Chael Sonnen was, he was a world-class fighter at his peak, no doubt. But he wasn't a name in the sport he wasn't one of the biggest names, certainly. If you were a hardcore fan, you knew Chael Sonnen. But if you weren't, he, you didn't know who he was. And the way he brought his name back was he started rivalries with fighters who were better than him. And he basically made himself into a polarizing figure. Uh, when he was being controversial, people were paying attention to him. Uh, there's one point where he actually talked his way into a fight up a division with John Jones, maybe the greatest of all time. He wasn't top 10 in that division. He wasn't going to be competitive against John Jones. And even I tuned into the fight thinking he had a chance to win. I mean, he had talked me into the building. He had talked me into buying the pay-per-view by creating this rivalry with John Jones, air quotes around the world rivalry. And I thought, that, that's, that's brilliant. And that'd be really fun. I think I'll start a rivalry with Paul Macbeth. And 
for anybody that knows anything about disc golf, that's not a rivalry. That's stupid. I'm not going to be competitive with Paul McBeth. I wasn't. There's nothing I was going to do that was going to make me challenge Paul McBeth on the golf course. So I thought, well, this is pretty innocent. I'm not going to do anything malicious or mean-spirited. I'm just going to be funny. But I'm going to pretend I have a rival with, with Paul McBeth. I'm going to use his name. I'm sorry, but he's a public figure. It's okay to use the name of a public figure to draw attention to yourself if you want to. Not unethically or, I mean, maliciously, but I mean, just simply using the person's name to put eyes on you. I mean, yeah, that comes with being a professional athlete. And I had no problem doing that. So I said, I'm going to start a rivalry with Paul McBeth. And that's what I did. So I started posting. I think my first post said uh, that I've declared Paul McBeth my sworn mortal enemy. And I remember being back at a tournament, um, a little tiny seat here in North Carolina. Uh, I finished, I believe, seventh place, last place money at a little seat here. But before the tournament, for the last several days, everyone had been following Paul because Paul was in Australia. Everyone knew Paul was in Australia getting ready for the Australian Open. So about an hour, I don't know, something before this little seat here in New Bern, North Carolina, I got on my Facebook and made a post that told Paul to be in New Bern in one hour or else everyone's going to know you're afraid to face me. Stupid, right? But people were laughing. People were being entertained. Thought it was funny. After the tournament, I got last place money. And after when I went to get my award, I think I got like $30 or something like that. I go to get my award. And I tell everybody, hey guys, do me a favor. Everybody get out your phones. And everybody gets out their phones and I, I give this little speech about, why are you ducking me, Paul? You're ducking me. Why are you afraid to face me, Paul? Everyone knows you're a coward. Again, I'm not being malicious. It's, it's stupid. If you believed that I was calling Paul McBeth a coward, then shame on you for not, <laughs> not understanding something so ridiculous. But again, it was funny and, and people were paying attention. With that came people who said, who the hell is this guy? I mean, Paul McBeth is the most popular player to ever play this game. It's never been close or debatable. So I knew by doing this, I was going to get some people who didn't like me, right? Some people just aren't going to get it. But I accepted that as the cost of building my brand. I'm going to be polarizing and some people are going to pay attention to me. Some people aren't going to like me, call them haters, but I never had a problem with them because uh, for crying out loud, I did, I, I chose this path myself. What do I expect to happen? I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm picking on Paul McBeth, right? So I, uh, it started working and I thought, oh my God, this is fantastic. Like I, I'm, this is, I, this is taking on a life of its own. People are paying attention to me. More people are showing up to my clinics. This is good. It's good stuff. So then I decided, I came up with this idea. I said, well, what if I get on social media and I make people think that I'm obsessed with Paul McBeth to a point that I'm starting to go crazy. And in every video and, and then subsequent video, I start to lose it a little bit more. And I even like, I called it descent into madness. And I storyboarded the thing out. So this is going to be fun. So the first thing I did was I was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I did a clinic and like 30 people showed up, which is way better than 10 that had showed up, you know, the month before at the clinics. And I asked everybody, hey, you guys want to be part of a, of a promotional stunt? And they're like, sure. So I, I said, I got, I'm going to hand you guys some questions. And so after I'm done, I want everybody to applaud. And then I'm going to ask for questions and I'm going to call on you and just repeat the question. Don't read the question, but repeat the question that I had written down. They thought, everybody's like, yeah, that sounds fun. So we start the camera, everybody applauds. And I go, cool, thank you guys for coming out to the Scott Stokely Clinic. I really appreciate that. Anybody have any questions? You, sir. And the person says to me, yeah, I got a question. So wh when does Paul switch from a putter to a mid-range disc? I mean, how far is Paul from the basket before he actually makes a disc change? And I kind of laughed it off and I said, oh, well, I wouldn't really know. You're gonna have to, I'm sorry, you're gonna have to ask Paul about that. Um, wish, wish I could help. Um, anybody else have any questions? And some, the next question was, yeah, so 
So when Paul's inside the circle and the, he has a headwind, and I'm like, okay, I get it. I, I don't know. And a few more people ask questions and eventually I snap at the audience. I go, guys, uh, why do you keep asking me about Paul? This is uh, you're the Scott Stokely Clinic. Really? Like you're out here to see me, not him. But I just act a bit perturbed at this little incident. I'm playing it straight. I'm not going ha ha at the end of my post. So I post about it and I'm complaining that Paul's getting press. And I'm supposed to be getting the press. It's my clinic. And, you know, I make, um, I, I don't know, I make a few more, <laughs> I make a few more videos where Paul's getting into my head and I'm getting more frustrated. And, and you know, at one, I made a little video where my girlfriend accidentally called me Paul in bed. Um, I thought that was funny. But, but again, every one of them comes with people going, you're an asshole. Why are you doing this? This is so stupid. You're bad for the sport. How about that? Um, but I also simultaneously, I got people, not one person. If you can go back, look at my old Facebook posts. If I think they're archived. I had lots of people posting, oh my God, Scott Stokely's making disc golf fun again. Now, it was already fun. But the spirit was, it had gotten a little bit uptight. And some people like it that way. But there was a group of people that said, hey, this is something different that I like. So I'm building a following of people, my echo chamber, people, but people that like it to be fun. And eventually I did a, a video. This is the first video that went somewhat viral within the sport. This is where I put tinfoil on my head. And I made a video where I claimed that Paul Macbeth was speaking to me through the fillings in my teeth. And you know, I was wearing tin foil so Paul couldn't talk to me because whenever I was trying to putt at tournaments, I could hear Paul's voice asking me why I could never beat Ken Climo at Worlds. And people are just like, they're, they're, some people are believing it. Most people are getting it, that it's fun. Again, I'm pissing more and more people off. I don't blame them. You know, you can't set out to do these things and then be upset when people react that way. I mean, come on, I knew this going in. Um, and then eventually I did a, a video where my girlfriend, we actually were at a hospital and we actually broke into their, their room where they do like press conferences so it could get a podium and a press release thing. And she read this prepared statement that said, uh, just wanted to let you know that Scott Stokely has been checked into a, a mental institution due to his obsession with Paul Macbeth. Please respect our family, you know, during these trying times and, you know. Um, what's funny was that her mom saw the post and actually apparently she bought the whole thing. Her mom messaged her, messages her and says, is, is Scott okay? Is Scott okay? She's like, yeah, yeah, mom, we're just being silly. So, I mean, it ran its course. And like my goal was not to, you know, like play with Paul the whole time. It was just a, a way of just putting eyes on me. I got five or something thousand subscribers or followers um it worked and i got eyes on me and people started showing up to my clinics and once the ball was rolling then i kind of just i just kind of let it fade out i got nothing against paul um i don't know what paul thinks of me we've talked a few times we get along i think he's a real nice guy i think he's a good man i think he's a great ambassador to the sport and i'm a fan of his big time fan of his he may have mixed opinions about me because I kind of threw his name out there for my own purpose. But again, you're you're a public figure and a professional athlete. These things, um, they're going to come with the territory. So I'm 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 cool with it. And again, nothing was malicious, so I'm fine. But I've got this camp of people now that think that I'm the bad guy. What are you going to do? Um, I'm growing my brand. It worked. The next thing I did that apparently was <laughs> controversial. Well, no, this one was, plain. no, let me rephrase that. The next thing I did that was controversial is I released a line of discs. I don't want to go into details now because I've attempted to distance myself from them, but I knew going in, these are going to be controversial. And they were, <laughs> I got a lot of haters off this, but again, I knew it going in that this was going to happen. I would have some pushback. So I never was, I never was or have been upset with anybody who has negative opinions about me because of it, because I did this myself. It was a choice. And my biggest regret of doing this isn't the brand of discs I released because I firmly believe and 
freedom and people's rights and you can't stand the government and all this, right? I still believe these things. I wish I hadn't done it because it didn't help my brand. That was it. Didn't do me any good. I distanced myself from it. You know, you got to chalk some of these things off to, to some ideas just don't work and that, and that idea just didn't work. So I let that one go. But again, a lot of people followed me because of it. A lot of people didn't. So I'm out traveling around and now I got this growing group of people that are paying attention to everything I'm doing. People are showing up to my clinics. I'm selling more products at clinics. I've got companies that are sponsoring me now. They want to sponsor me and which is great because I'm at the time I'm in, I'm still in the open division. I still hadn't won a tournament in 13 years. I'm, you know, shooting like 980 golf or something like that. You know, I'm not too shabby for being gone for so long, but certainly not high level. Um, but I'm getting more people paying attention to me than the other 980 golfers. Um, I think of this when I think of uh, there's players out there now that are real solid 10, 20 golfers. And there's so many good golfers and so much talent out there that a 10, 20 golfer is basically invisible. But you don't have to be. And I'm not suggesting doing anything that I've done, but you can not be vanilla, share your personality, take a stand, be outspoken, do something different, and people will know who you are. People know Nico DeCastro. There are other golfers with his rating that you've never heard of. For better or for worse, people know Nico. Nico is great for Nico's brand. Um, by the way, Nico's a real good guy too. Nico's good for the sport, he puts eyes on the sport. Nico's good for Nico. So I'm not suggesting to follow that path either, but that's something that you can do. You want, don't be invisible. Um, that doesn't help you. I, unless you're setting world records and winning world championships, then your game can speak for itself. But minus that, you gotta do something to stand out. All right, so now I'm traveling around the country and I get contacted by a, uh, a Ricky Singleton. He, this is one of my favorite stories, it's so much fun. I got contacted by Ricky Singleton. He is a player out of uh, South Bend, Indiana. And he said, hey, Scott, nice to meet you. I've been following you. Uh, I'm doing a fundraiser for a three-year-old girl named Sophia. And Sophia has a congenital heart defect. And we're trying to raise uh, some money for her to buy a couple defibrillators because she can't go to school unless she has a defibrillator at school and insurance won't pay for it because it's preventative or some whatever. Screw you insurance companies. But we're trying to raise money for her. We're going to do an auction. Would you be willing to sign a disc and donate it? And I said to him, I said, well, wait a second. And he tells me all about little Sophia. And I, I thought it was a great thing. And he says, uh, I said, how much are we trying to raise? And he says, $10,000. And I said, I, I can raise $10,000. And he said, how? And I said, I don't know yet, but I can, right? I said, give me an hour. This is all the true story. I said, give me an hour. I'll come up with something. So he, about an hour later, he calls me back and I said, I got it. I know exactly what we're going to do. I'm going to do a charity match against another top pro. Asking people for donations doesn't work. Generally speaking, people, people will donate, but people, a lot more people like to gamble than donate. And I said, I'm going to do a charity match against another top pro. And we're going to let people wager on the outcome of the match. And all the money they wager is going to go to Sophia's family. But what they have to win by wagering is prizes that are donated by my sponsors and this other player's sponsors, whoever wants to donate. Easy to get sponsors to donate prizes. Easy to get people to gamble to win prizes. Hard to get cash donations from people or sponsors. So I said, that's what we're going to do. I'm going to have to do a charity match. And I got to find a player to do it. My first thought was, I'm going to Paul. And I messaged Paul and... I don't blame him one bit. I didn't get a reply. <laughs> By the way, if, if we exchange texts now on social media or something like that, you know, I'll, I'll tell Paul congratulations. He writes back, thank you. I mean, we're, we're not like, we don't butt heads or anything like that. But this, I just came off the whole descent into madness thing. So I, I don't blame him for not replying. Um, so what am I going to do? Who am I going to go? Well, Jeremy Colling 
he's a good guy. Just I'd met him. I was a fan of his, and he just won the memorial. So his name was big. Um, he won the memorial in February. This was in March, and it was March Madness that got me thinking about all the betting pools. That's what kind of got the idea of gambling over donations. So I messaged Jeremy, and I said, hey, Jeremy. And I told him the idea I want to do a charity match. Well, the first thing I said is, like, hey, Jeremy, do you want to uh, you know, increase your fan base by 10,000 people in two weeks? He's like, I'm listening. And I told him the idea. He says, that's a great idea. And, I, and then I said, but we only have one problem. Nobody thinks this is a competitive match. Me against you? You're Jeremy Colling. You're one of the favorites to win the world championships this year. I haven't won a tournament in 13 years. No one's going to buy into this match being competitive. Here's what we're going to do. I said, we're going to do this WWE style. We're going pro wrestling. I said, I'm going to make a call out video on social media to you. And then you're going to make a call out video back. And then we're going to start going back with promo videos. And we're going to make everybody think that we hate each other. And we're going to generate interest in this match because people are going to choose sides. And he says, well, how are, why are people going to choose? He was a wrestling, old school wrestling guy too. But he's like, well, how are people going to choose sides? And I said, easy. I'm going to be the bad guy. Right? It's pro wrestling 101. You have a good guy and a bad guy. Half the people, excuse me. People come out, half the people that come out to see their, the good guy win, they're rooting for it, but the other half of the people that come out to a wrestling match are out there because they're pissed off at the bad guy and they want to see him get his ass kicked. And so if we can polarize the audience and make them think that I'm a bad guy and that you're the good guy, well, he is a good guy, I said, people will pay attention. And he's like, I remember this, he said, Scott, do you, you really want to make people hate you? And I'm like, yeah, it's going to be super fun. I'm going to make people think I'm an asshole. And he's like, all right, I'm game. So all of a sudden I make this call out video where I'm, I'm, I'm making fun of the way he walks and I'm calling him, I'm just calling him, I'm just picking on him and making fun. It's all in fun, but it's very aggressive and I'm shitting all over him. And I'm also coming across like a jerk on purpose. And a lot of people following are like, Oh, this is cool. I see what he's doing. This is great. I'm interested in this match now. But there were people who were like, wow, what an asshole. Like, he's just calling out Jeremy Cole. Jeremy's a good guy. Why is he being a jerk to Jeremy? And I'm like, perfect. It's working. I go, I wanted people to buy into what I was doing. The more people believed me, the more people are going to bet on the match. The more of an emotional response they have to what I'm doing, the more of an interest they're going to have, they're going to bet. So I said, perfect. Uh... Jeremy comes back, he makes a video where he's this really good guy. He's coming across classy and professional, um, which by the way, he's also to the anti-hero crowd. There are people who are like, well, I don't like that guy. You know, the whole idea of Hulk Hogan, say your prayers, eat your vitamins. In the 80s, that made you a good guy. But in pro wrestling in 2014, if you're that schmarmy good, like people dislike you so some people were definitely taking my side and like rooting for me because oh, that guy Jeremy is so schmarmy and cocky and arrogant doesn't matter they were paying attention um, and they were writing back you know people were writing they were following they were reposting um, at one point <laughs> I made a video where I said hey Jeremy I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some hidden camera footage I'm gonna, that someone's gonna anonymously air quotes on anonymously send you and I made this video where I was practicing putting for a tournament and someone's got their camera and they're like, hey, that's Scott Stokely. And they're coming over to film me practicing. And as soon as they do it, these three kids come up to me and ask me for my autograph and I chew them away because they're not 1030 rated and I, they run off crying. It's, it's so stupid and so silly. And I sent it to Jeremy and I said, post this and tell people send someone sent it to you anonymously because of what a jerk Scott Stokely is. And he posted it and... You know, 80% of people laughed and 20% of people are like, wow, Scott Stokely's a jerk. He just chased away a bunch of kids. Like people, there were people who believed it. It's so funny, but they did. And uh, like I was enjoying it, but they paid attention and they started gambling. And there were people who posted, this is so bad for the sport. Like, why do they have to do that? Just post a donation link, I'll donate. And it was like, really dude? Like, I'm sorry. Get on your Facebook page right now. Find someone on GoFundMe trying to raise $10,000 and post a link and saying, hey, here's a good cause. You're not getting $10,000 donated. 
um, Jeremy and I raised all $10,000. You know, we raised like 5,900 and then a, a couple thousand were bet the day of the event when we actually had our match. And then um, we ended up being like $2,000 short and someone anonymously donated 2,000 afterwards. We still don't know who that person is. Uh, and we got our $10,000 and we did it. And it was fun. And it was great for my brand because a lot of people are like, got what I did. That's really cool. That's really fun. The people that like me, my echo chamber thinks that was great. But, you know, with the territory came haters. But again, I'm, how can I get mad at the haters? Like I set out to make people not like me and have an, enough of an emotional response because I wanted to raise money for Sophia. So I'm not going to get pissed off at you for not liking me because I'm sorry. That just that comes with the territory. So <clears throat> these are examples of ways that I've tried to, you know, build this brand to myself. But by being outspoken or having an opinion, you're going to have people that are going to oppose you. It just comes with the territory. Um, when I had this line of discs out, for example, I made a post that said, if you're racist, sexist, or homophobic, don't buy my discs. I don't want my economy mixing with yours. I don't want your money. I don't want to do business with you. A lot of people thought that was great. I had people write me and they actually, honest to God, they said, wait, are you saying that just because I'm racist, I can't buy your discs? And I would respond with, yeah, you're correct. I don't want your money. Like, I don't care about you know, one person's money. Like, I got my opinions in this world. And, and um, a lot of people thought that was cool. There were people that thought that I was discriminating against people who were racist, sexist, or homophobic. I had people that said, oh, that's just reverse discrimination. Because you're picking out a class of people and saying you won't do business with them. People are going to be, you know, there's always going to be people if you do something public and you take a stand. Um, I'll tell you one of the funniest ones that I got. This was great. Like you would expect no blowback whatsoever. And I got blowback anyways. Um, there was this kid came up to me at a tournament. Or not a tournament. It was a Blue Power event. He came up to me and he says, hey, can I get your autograph? And as soon as he goes to, I was sponsored by MVP at the time. Just, and as soon as he hands me the disc, he, his head goes down and he puts his head down. And I went, well, what are you, why are you sad? He goes, oh, well, I don't have an MVP disc for you to sign. And I'm like, why would you care? Like, why would it matter if it's an MVP disc? And his dad was there. And his dad said, yeah. So he went up to his favorite pro at a tournament, asked the pro to sign his disc. And the pro told him no, because his disc was not the manufacturer of that pro sponsor. This is a true story. Um, it happened in Euclid, Ohio. And... I'm like, he, so some guy wouldn't sign your disc because it wasn't his sponsor's, it wasn't made by his sponsor. Dad's like, yeah. And I was livid. Like, I don't know if I've ever been this angry since I've been playing the game. And so I made a video and I posted it to my Facebook page. I didn't name names because I'm only hearing one side of the story and jumping to a conclusion off hearing one side of the story. I would do that when I was 20. It's ignorant to do that now. So I'm not going to signal anybody out. But that didn't invalidate what I said. And what I said was, I told the story. And I said, just wanted to let you know that if I'm in a tournament and I see you and you do this, I will drag you off into the woods and I'm going to kick the shit out of you. And then I stopped and I said, and just so you know, that's not an idle threat. I will beat the shit out of you if I see you not sign an autograph for a kid who looks up to you. Now, you would think that that wouldn't be controversial. Who could possibly have a problem with that? Well, apparently I was inciting violence against other players. I got a letter from an organization that didn't like what I had said. Um, I don't care. <laughs> I'll say it again. If I saw that happen, I would drag that person off in the woods. Um, I don't care. So there's going to be haters. But you're building a brand. So I don't think there's a problem with with doing things that are controversial 
Um, and just expecting the people, not everybody's going to like you. And you have to accept that. Just the fact that you're a pro athlete means there's other pro athletes people are going to root for. And so when I talked to the person on the phone, when they called, I, I didn't tell him those stories. Actually, I brought him up and he was familiar with some of these stories. And I said, so you can't, you know, you're winning tournaments. You're a pro. You know, part of it is just you got to deal with it. This comes to the territory. Go play league night and play for fun if you don't want any blowback. As a professional athlete, you're open to that criticism. It's like saying, I don't like people hating on me when I make a post on social media. Well, then don't post on social media. When you put something out there into the ether, you have to expect things to come back. Um, to this day, I I don't delete posts. I, when I, or sorry, I don't delete comments on my YouTube videos, on my Facebook. I believe everybody's entitled to what they have to say. And if they want to say that they don't like something I said, hey, my stuff's public. I'm a public figure, or I've sought out to become a public figure on purpose. So that just comes to the territory. Now, there's a different type of hater. So the rest of those, let me just clarify, the rest of those haters, I think are actually kind of fun. Uh, by the way, I would like, I want to point something out because I'm being a big boy today because I'm terrified of heights and I've been sitting here the whole time distracted because there's a cliff of, the cliffs of insanity <laughs> sitting right behind me. And um, I just want to point that out because this, I'm, I'm kind of starting to get a little more comfortable, but I've, I've been like nervous as heck sitting here. Um, so there's another type of hater, hater, and that's the ones who are, for all, appearances mean and malicious and they're attacking you things for things that you haven't brought on yourself right they're not because you said something controversial or took a stand they're not hating on you because you're you know simply because you're good but they're questioning your character or they're they're taking low blows they're saying things that hurt and I've had to come to grips with that as well And I talked about this, the, the where this came about more than ever was when I did my special needs classes, my blue power classes. And I, I, I won't go into length on this, but just real briefly, I was traveling around the country and aside from 20 actual fundraisers I raised, the first 200 or so of the 270 events I did, I was running, like I discussed earlier, I was running I would do a clinic. I would run doubles. It was just, that was my business. In addition to that, I said, hey, there's this free special needs class if you come out an hour earlier. This is, the, the event's not a fundraiser. It's, it's just simply, I'm offering a free special needs class. And then I would buy all the special needs players a disc and a shirt out of my own pocket just for coming out. And people started posting about, oh yeah, where's all the money going? Oh yeah, like he's, He's just donate like he's just doing this out of the goodness of his heart. Yeah, he's really buying these discs. He's stealing from the special needs community. Like the, the, the craziest, most hurtful, mean things you could possibly do to a point where I, I, I want to say I was close, but I thought hard about just not doing it. I was like, well, screw it. If I'm, I'm traveling around the country trying to do all this good stuff and people are just going to shit on me. Like, then I'm not going to do it anymore. I don't need to deal with this. And, and you know, I, I kept at it, though. I kept at it because I would get one of those, and then a special needs family would send me an email about how much it meant to them. And I'm like, that's way more important. But I wasn't immune to it. And um, it, to the point, by the way, where I, I would, when people made donations, like, I wouldn't allow them to donate to me directly. When someone wanted to donate money to Blue Power, I would say, donate to a local autism organization. I'm doing fine, I don't need your money. Um, I wasn't, I was poor as hell, but I said, I don't, I don't want your money, donate. Don't give it to me to donate for you because then people are gonna question where it goes. So I told them to donate directly. Uh, eventually, 10% of the money that came in, I did start saying 10% of all money that comes in goes to a local art, autism organization, like my last 70 events. I had the club donate direct. I wouldn't even touch the money because I wanted to be in a position where the haters couldn't say anything. I mean, 
it was ugly. And I had to come to terms with that. I had to figure out how I can keep doing this and keep positive and keep happy when these when there were people that were out to knock me down. And this is what I spoke to the person the other night who called about. And what I came up with, the way I have dealt with the haters, and I'm sharing this because we've all, at least a lot of us, have experienced this before. And this is a paradigm that's allowed me to be happy. And these people, when they come up, they're fewer and farther between because I'm less controversial now. So I have less haters in general. Um, but the way, the way I figured this out was I, I came up with this idea just an idea for understanding human behavior called the the happiness gap and the happiness gap comes from some real studies that have shown that a person or a group of people's happiness is as much dictated by the happiness not the happiness but of what life is like around them what other people are going through there are villages in Kenya where People are struggling because they don't have clean water. Um, they don't have any of the cool, fun gadgets that we have. Um, infant mortality is high. HIV is high. They're poor. And they're happy. And the question is, well, how could these people be happy when they're struggling in so many ways? How could they be happier than a lot of people in the West when we have so much more and not just materialistically, but we have opportunities and we have more freedoms and we have, I mean, you can fault our government, fault our police force. I agree with all of it. I'm very anti-establishment, but our government and police force are a lot better than Kenya's and Nigeria's. I'm sorry. They don't even have a, a system and an infrastructure where they can thrive and, and have opportunities and yet they're happy. Why? And one of the theories, which is a real good one, is that when they look around, no one else has it any better. There's, there's no real gap between you and your neighbor if you're all struggling with the same thing. And, and so they can find happiness because this is just the way life is in their world. And one of the problems that we face in the West, why depression can be so much higher in Western countries, is because there can be a gap a, rather a, perce a perceived gap between the happiness of others and our own. You know, I'm 100% pro-capitalism, but in a capitalist society, you have the haves and the have-nots. And it's really easy to look around and see people that have more than you. And no matter how much you have, no matter how much more you have than the people in Kenya, when you look around in your world, you don't see that. You just see that these people have more than you. There's a gap between you and them. And then there's this perception that they're happier because they have more. They have more money. Of course they're happier. They've got more attractive spouses on average. They must be happier. Um, they seem to be, everything seems to go their way. And um, you see that and you begin to, you hurt, you feel pain. You feel pain because you're not seeing what you have, you're seeing what you don't have. And the more you don't have, the more painful it is. Um, this happens a lot, and there's a lot of studies on this that happens in social media, because in social media, boy, it sure appears that everyone else is, like they just took a picture of that great dinner they had, and you're eating a TV dinner or a frozen pizza, um, they take a picture when they get a new car. They take a picture or they post about their promotion. I mean, a lot of people post the bad stuff, but you, you can have this perception that everyone else's life is better than yours. And that leads to depression. Like, that's another area that leads to depression because everyone else seems to be having it better than you. Um, same thing, celebrities. You see celebrities even to the, this day when they're on TV shows, they're on the red carpet, they're the lifestyle of the rich and famous. I dated myself. It's MTV Cribs. <laughs> Still dated myself. Whatever show today that shows how much better the, the rich and the celebrities have it than us, right? That's where there's, there, there, there's a gap. And so when there's a gap, you feel pain. So where this applies to the haters is when you are successful 
And when you are happy, when you get a promotion, when, you, when you're in love, when you win a disc golf tournament, the people that are struggling, the gap between you and them is big. And because the gap between you and them is big, they feel pain. They might be perfectly satisfied with the level of their disc golf game, but if you've only been playing a couple years and you're winning pro tournaments, all of a sudden they're not feeling as good about where they're at because you appear to have more. You are successful financially. There are people who aren't successful financially who have a problem with you because you have more. It's, it, the gap is what causes the pain. And so a person is left with two choices if they want to alleviate their pain. The first choice is the hard one, right? You want to be financially successful? That takes work, discipline, effort, years of your life. It's hard. If it was easy, everybody would be financially su successful, right? It is hard to do. You want to be good at disc golf? That's great. 12 years later, between five and seven million throws of discipline, training, skipping league night to train, quitting smoking, being healthy, doing all the things you're going to do, that's hard. Right? All these things. Having a good relationship is hard. That's one of their options. The haters have one option to do something really, really hard to close that gap. The other option to close that gap is simply to knock you down. If they can knock you down, then they don't feel that same level of pain, right? Like if you work your ass off to get a promotion, most of the people are happy that you got a promotion, but you'll, you will have people that'll say, well, whose ass did you have to kiss to get that? Well, if they can knock you down and take away from all the hard work, and now you're just some ass kisser, well, then you're not this person that is achieving more and having more than them. You're just some guy who got lucky or girl who got lucky. You know, I, I've seen this, um, another, another example of this is, uh, I've seen this in relationships. Um, or when it comes to relationships, you tell a group of people, oh my God, I met someone, I'm so happy. I'm so, I think I met the one. I think I met the one. Oh my God, I'm so in love. And someone says, well, oh my God, how, wait, how long have you been dating? Three days. Within that group of people, you're going to get a mixed response. You'll get some who, are, who just say, oh my God, I, I'm so happy for you. You'll also get people who say, three days? Really? You're in love after three days? Yeah, call me in six months and tell me how it's going. <laughs> I would almost guarantee you in advance that the person that shits all over the fact that you're really happy right now, they're not in a good relationship. The gap between your happiness from your relationship and where they are is so big that that's painful for them. They have to knock you down to where they are. Whereas the person who's happily married, they don't feel pain when they see your happiness. There's no gap. They're happy too. They're the ones who are happy for you. Think about the happiness gap when you observe human behavior and you'll see this happen all the time and you go, oh my God, that, that, that's the way it is, you know? Um, or at least it's very common. So as this applies to how I've dealt with the haters is when I was traveling around the country trying to do all these good things, instead of being mad at the people who are shitting on it, I started thinking that there's a gap between me and them. And they live in a world and they live in a space they can't even conceive of the idea of somebody that is trying so hard to do so much good and to make so many people happy and is being so giving and so unselfish. They can't even, they can't even believe that's possible. And the reason they can't believe that's possible is probably because they've never had that in their life. And if they've never had anybody like that in their life, what a tragedy for them. And instead of being angry at them for hating on me, I started to pity them. And I don't mean pity in a bad way. I mean pity in a, I really started to feel for them. I started to feel empathy for them and compassion for them. 
that their life has led them to a place where they can't even understand when someone does good. And the reason I changed this paradigm was simply because I wanted to be happier. Because as soon as I saw them that way, as soon as I realized they're not being malicious when they're hating on me. That's not their, their intent. Their t intent really truly isn't to hurt me. It's that they feel pain at my success. They feel pain at, at seeing what, I've, what I achieve in life. And they're just trying to alleviate their pain. If they can knock me down, it makes them feel better. And so I just feel bad for them. I now feel bad for these people that they have to go through life feeling pain. And as soon as that switched in my head, now I, I just love them. It sounds stupid and old school hippie-ish, but I do. I, I, I just feel love for them. I mean, I don't think I can help them, but I'm no longer angry at them. I'm at, I'm at peace with their, that they exist. And I'm so grateful that I'm not them. And, and uh, now I feel gratitude. I, f I feel gratitude for my position in life. I feel very proud of the, the fact that I've worked so hard to get the things I have that, that, that would cause people to feel this way about me. And so that's how I look at the, at the haters, you know? So I've, I've been polarizing. I've been controversial. That's unintentional and that's fun. It's building a brand, it's, it's business. I've been outspoken and that's interesting and I have built my following because of it. And then when people hate on me simply because I'm me, because of how I live my life, whether it's because I'm successful or because I try to help people or whatever reason they have, I don't feel hatred or anger. I, I just, I feel love and they don't, uh, they don't bother me anymore. I'm, I don't wanna say I'm immune to them. I've ha I have my moments. But for the most part, I, I coexist with them. I don't block them from my social media. I don't delete their posts. I just leave them out there to, you know, show that there's a variety of people out there. And I accept their opinions. So I don't know if that got a little bit less fun at the end there, but I felt inspired to share about these things because it's fun. And by the way, I am shaking now. Um, it is cold. It is cold at 14,000 feet, and I'm gonna turn this camera off, and uh, I would love feedback on it. I mean, how do you guys feel about the haters? How do you feel, how do you deal with them? You know, give me your thoughts. I would love to hear from you. Talk to you guys later.